Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Tonight we've got a great show for you. We're going to be talking about folate and MTHFR. It's one of our most requested topics, so stay tuned. We're going to be talking about all kinds of pearls and tips that you can walk away with tonight to make sure that your nutrition is optimized. If you're new to the show, if you're new to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain, say hello, don't be a stranger, type in your name, let us know where you're tuning in from. And as always, I'll, I'll hit up all the questions at the end of the show. So if you've got specific nutritional questions you'd like me to entertain or answer, just a couple different things. Number one, first come, first serve. So get those questions in early and I'll do my best to answer them. Number two, try to keep them on topic. If they get a little too esoteric and they don't really match much of the show, we'll, we'll uh, postpone answering any of those types of questions. So try to keep it on topic. So. Stay with me tonight because we're going to be talking again about the kind of the pearls that you'll want to understand, especially if you're supplementing with folate or if you've been told you have an MTHFR gene mutation or genetic SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. So those of you um, with MTHFR um, where you've had a, a DNA test to, to confirm that, again, it's one of our most requested topics. So let's dive in to... Folate. Let me back up here on the screen here. So folate is a B vitamin, actually sometimes referred to as vitamin B9. And as a B vitamin, it plays a major role in energetics. So it helps the body to generate um, energy, ATP from carbohydrates, fats, and other macronutrients like protein, etc. So it's very, very important in those things. But um, We'll come to some of that. Let's cover what to look for. So, you know, people that have folate deficiency, these are some of the most common symptoms associated with low folate. And you'll see some of these, they're not really diseases per se. They're kind of what we would call the preclinical, like the things that happen to a person before they really start to manifest major or serious disease-based side effects. So, again, in this case, we've got swollen tongue. This also... Um, so if you've ever noticed that your tongue gets a little fatter, a little bit thicker, that's folate. That can be a folate deficiency. Now, additionally, you can see the image right up here, the cracks in the corners of the mouth. That's called angular stomatitis, the fancy name or the fancy way of saying that. But this can occur as a result of folate deficiency. Also can occur as a result of iron deficiency and vitamin B2. But folate, very, very common. Now, these are some of the, again, these are some of the early warnings that, that this is happening with you. Mouth ulcers are another one. So if you've ever had the aptus ulcers or the blisters form inside the mouth or around the lips, that can be a symptom of folate deficiency as well. And this next one's a big one, depression. Now, some people would say, well, Dr. Osborne, depression is a disease. And you're right, but a lot of people have subclinical or preclinical depression. So in essence, before they seek out medical care, they just find themselves um, in a depressed state without really realizing that it's, that it's, or without really feeling like it's really hindering them to a great degree. But research on depression, and this is true of, of those of you who've ever taken SSRIs, these are medicines like Paxil or Prozac, SSRI, that stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor, but these medications, there's some research studies that show that these medications are not effective unless you add folate to them, which begs the question, is it the drug that's working or is it the folate that's working? We'll talk about um, why this happens here in just a minute. And part of it has to do with folate's role in the production of the chemical serotonin. Forgetfulness can also be a symptom of folate deficiency. So if you've ever struggled with word recall, you know the word, your brain knows it, but you can't bring it to the lips. This can be a sign of folate deficiency, but also just not remembering very well. You gotta put up little sticky notes on the refrigerator, you know, around the house so that you remember to do basic fundamental things. Diarrhea as well. Now this is particularly true um, in those, of, uh, those individuals who've gone through chemotherapy. And I, I bring this up because maybe many of you, maybe some of you are struggling with cancer and you're on some type of chemotherapeutic regimen. You have to understand that chemotherapy leads to a reduction of folate. And this is one of the reasons why chemotherapy tends to cause diarrhea or gastrointestinal uh, issues. It's because the blugs can inhibit the body's ability to absorb and to generate folate. And so one of, the, one of the hallmarks nutritionally to help a person with chemotherapy who's having chronic diarrhea 
is to actually give them higher levels of folate to help appease some of the gastrointestinal symptoms associated with taking that chemotherapy. So if you're here and you're struggling here, you need, maybe you want to consider folate in your regimen to help with that. Because remember, if, you're, if you've got cancer and you've got diarrhea as a result of the chemo, what comes after diarrhea? Malnourishment, vitamin and mineral deficiency. Well, what do you need to recover from cancer? Good nutrition, good vitamins, good minerals. So if the same drug that you're using to treat it is creating malnutrition, you end up in a vicious circle. Now, another symptom of folate deficiency, kind of pre, again, pre, early clinical numbness and tingling. And this could be numbness and tingling in the hands, numbness and tingling in the feet what some doctors refer to as neuropathy. If it gets severe enough, it can become debilitating, extremely painful. I mentioned poor memory along with for forgetfulness earlier, and then as well, confusion. And this is particularly true. We see this in the elderly. We'll see them start to lose their ability cognitively to think clearly. They get confused more easy, and this can oftentimes be as a result of folate deficiency because many of the drugs that the elderly are taking are actually inhibited by, or actually not inhibited by, but many of those drugs inhibit the way that folate works in the body and that can lead to that confusion. And then as well, insomnia, one of the, one of the functions of folate here is it helps to convert serotonin, it methylates serotonin into melatonin. So I ran out of room here. Let's see here. Melatonin. There we go. So in, in essence, we, we also make melatonin through sunlight. Sunlight exposure to the eyes helps our body optimize melatonin production. But biochemically, we need folate to be able to do that. So some people um, don't sleep as well because of folate deficiency because they can't convert serotonin into melatonin very effectively. Remember, both folate is necessary for this conversion, but folate is also necessary, generally speaking, for the production of serotonin. So very important um, nutrient with a lot of different side effects. Now I want to draw a diagram for you because I want to kind of show you a lot of you, again, number one topic request, um, have asked about folate. And what I'm drawing you is the methylation cycle, or at least the very rudimentary um, approach to drawing the, the methylation cycle. But many of you have the five or the M T H F R mutations. And there are different kinds of MTHFR mutations. We're not going to get into those tonight, but many of you have this MTHFR. You've had this test done and you've either got an A to C or a, or a T to C um, mutation. And your doctor has said, hey, with that mutation, it increases your risk of having problems associated with lower levels of folate. And so I want you to kind of understand how this works. So if we look at, um, at the, these three circles, these three circles represent the methylation cycle, and in this center cycle, we've got MTHFR, which is, stands for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. This is an enzyme that helps turn folate and activate it. It activates folate into its most biologically active form. And what happens is so MTHFR forms methylfolate. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to get too technical or too chemical, but I just want you to know methylfolate is the folate, the natural folate that helps to spin this wheel. And that's what I want you to think. This is like almost think of it like a water wheel and folate spins it around. And when this wheel spins, it helps to spin this wheel and it helps to spin this wheel as well. So we've got a wheel these wheels are like cogs in a clock. You know, when one cog turns, it helps the other cogs turn as well. And so this is this center wheel, which is folate driven, folate dependent, is so crucial for the function of methylation. What is methylation? Methylation, let's just kind of simply say methylation is a process where, where, by which the body can aid in detoxification and the body can aid in the production of neurochemicals and aid in the repair of cells, right? So if, we, if this cycle is broken, 
uh, as a result of folate deficiency, there's a lot of problems that can crop up. I'm going to share some more of those problems with you here in just a minute, but I want to draw this out because I want you to understand this. So methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase is an enzyme, and some people have a mutation, okay, a genetic mutation or a DNA mutation, sometimes referred to as a SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. And so if you have one of these, then this cycle is less efficient. It doesn't work as well. Now, part of the cycle, uh, you've heard me talk about this chemical a number of times, but there's a chemical called homocysteine. And homocysteine is an independent risk factor in, and it can cause and contribute to heart disease, cancer. It can contribute to diabetes. It can contribute to bone loss, among other things. But homocysteine, this is a wheel right here. This wheel converts homocysteine into methionine. Now, methionine is a very important amino acid. And again, you need folate to do that, to convert homocysteine into methionine. Methionine goes on to make new DNA and to make new RNA. So you need that methionine for healing and for repair and for body maintenance. It's very, very critical that we can do this. Now, another offshoot of this is homocysteine is not just converted into methionine and then DNA and RNA repair, but it also helps to produce bile acids, which aid in detoxification. And it also helps to produce glutathione, which many of you have heard of. Glutathione is the master antioxidant. It's what your liver uses to basically uh, break toxins down and make them water soluble. So two very important offshoots of this methylation cycle are bile acid production and glutathione. So many people struggle in this area because this, and this hinders or slows down their detoxification. And then we have this wheel or this cycle over here. And in this cycle, what happens is this cycle helps to convert tyrosine, which is an amino acid, Okay, and tryptophan, which is also an amino acid. Amino acids are building blocks from protein, right? Tyrosine helps to form dopamine, which is a neurochemical. It's a happy chemical, makes your brain happy, makes you have good thoughts. And tryptophan helps you make serotonin. So just a minute ago when I was talking about serotonin and melatonin and folate's role in memory, etc., it's because of this, right? We need that folate to drive the production of serotonin and dopamine. And again, these are primary neurochemicals that allow you to have happy thoughts. This is why when we come back over here and we look at the symptoms of folate deficiency, what do we see? We see depression, right? Because if you can't make serotonin and dopamine efficiently, depression can set in and this can really wreak havoc on a person's health. So this methylation cycle is very important. And the reason why I even demonstrate that is because many of you come to me and say, hey, Dr. Osborne, I have this MTHFR mutation. Can you help me understand better what that means? Here's what it means. If your gene is mutated, then this pathway, your ability to make homocysteine convert to methionine for new DNA and RNA, your ability to make dopamine, serotonin, and to produce glutathione, all those things are hindered. They're slowed down. They're reduced. It doesn't mean your body can't do it. It just means your body's less optimized. It also means that you might need to really focus more on your diet and your dietary sources of folate. And we'll talk about those here shortly in just a minute as well, because if you're not getting adequate folate uh, and you have one of these genetic mutations, it can really start to create bigger problems for you. So that being said, let's talk about one of the other major symptoms of folate. And I, I give it its own graphic here just because I, I, this is so common. We see that this is such a common side effect of folate, and that has to do with the anemia that folate can cause. So one of the diseases, okay, that folate creates is anemia, and this specifically it's a macrocytic anemia. Macro means large. Cytic means cell. So cytic, macrocytic anemia means large cell anemia. And so what happens is your red blood cells, when they're born, they're very big. So let's just pretend this is a red blood cell. And folate helps the red blood cell mature. So when a red blood cell matures, it gets smaller. And it, when it continues to mature, it gets even smaller and it takes on a different shape. It trades out, the cell nucleus goes away and we get hemoglobin in it instead. And this is what a red blood cell looks like, like a little disc. And so what we get in that disc is oxygen. That's where oxygen is carried. It's also where carbon dioxide is carried. And so folate, very important, for taking that very large red blood cell and helping it to mature to a 
properly sized red blood cell, which again um, allows us to carry oxygen. What happens if we can't do this? If we're anemic and we're not carrying oxygen because we're stuck and our red blood cells are large and basically they're large and they're clumsy, they don't carry oxygen as well, okay, is we start to develop this laundry list of symptoms here, fatigue, headaches, muscle weakness, heart palpitations, weight loss, loss of appetite, dizziness, shortness of breath, all symptoms potentially of anemia. In this case, as we talk about folate, this is one of the most common um, conditions in the US today are anemias. And so a lot of people equate anemia to iron deficiency. Um, although iron deficiency can cause anemia, folate causes a different type of anemia. So kind of the takeaway here if you're having or struggling with this series of symptoms, the fatigue, the headaches, the muscle weakness, the exercise intolerance, your heart's beating really rapidly, okay, dizziness, shortness of breath, if you go to altitude and you completely lose your ability to function, that, that may be a sign of anemia as well, then you could be folate deficient. Now, one of the tests that you can ask your doctor to run is something called MCV, mean corpuscular volume. This is a test, it's part of a standard blood test um, that helps you understand whether or not your red blood cells are too large. Okay, so if your MCV value is high, if it's too high, it's in indicating that your red blood cells are large and they're stuck in this clumsy state, and it's a potential indicator that you might have a folate deficiency. Although this could also be vitamin B12, so you have to be careful. Sometimes uh, it's folate, sometimes it's B12 that creates this type of anemia. And, uh, and so again, this is just a really inexpensive way to get a simple blood test done where if this is going on or if you have a history of, of a high MCV and your doctor never told you what it meant, this is what it means. And it might mean that you have a folate deficiency, so you might want to get it looked at. Okay, let's talk about some additional folate-related conditions here. Um, folate has a lot of different functions. And, and, you know, we mentioned earlier, we said that folate played a role in red blood cell production. Just now we said that it, folate plays a role in DNA and RNA synthesis and detoxification. And it also plays a role in neurotransmitter synthesis. But those aren't the only roles for folate. One of folate's other roles, I'm going to just circle this one because this is a big one, birth defects as well as pregnancy complications. And there's a, a term, you probably have heard this, neural tube defects. This is a major problem in the United States in an industrialized country. So NTD, neural tube defects. What is a neural tube defect? If you've ever heard of the disease spina bifida or cleft palate, these are forms of neural tube defects. When, the, when a baby is growing inside the mom, uh, the, there's a part uh, of, there's a formation that occurs, neurologically speaking, of the neural tube. So the neural tube is maturing and it's, and it's properly forming, but folate deficiency will lead to um, DNA damage that, that contributes to these neural tube defects. So babies are born with birth defects. Again, that's what, that's what spina bifida is, and that's what cleft palate. Some children are born with their tongue ties. Okay, these could potentially be the mom having low levels of folate coming into pregnancy. It could also, folate deficiency can also cause pregnancy complications. So ladies, if you've had spontaneous abortion or if you've had you know, miscarriages, that this may also be folate. Remember, folate deficiency leads to poor ability to replicate DNA and RNA. Now, why is that important? Because why do we make new DNA and RNA? It's for cell growth. Where do we see cell growth more than any other time in life beyond our, our young bodies growing? As adults, as ladies, we see cell growth occur in that fetus, the rapidly dividing cells where we need a lot of folate to make this happen. Now, this, so again, the, the DNA and the RNA replication, which is what folate is responsible for doing, leads to, I should say, not just cell growth, but normal cell growth, because you can get um, there are some, some, some conditions, for example, uh, if you've ever been diagnosed with cervical 
neoplasia, which I don't think is on this list, but I'm going to talk about it because this is one of the really common things. Cervical neoplasia, what some doctors call intraepithelial cervical neoplasia, or CIN, um, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, right, CIN. Um, this is a form of precancer, right, of the cervix in females, and we know folate plays a role in this. So, so again, DNA and RNA growth. When DNA and RNA are not replicating properly, we can, we can enhance the ability of cells to grow abnormally. So it increases the risk for cancer of the cervix. It also increases the risk, if we're talking about cancer, of colon cancers. There's linkage to colon cancer and folate deficiency. So um, again, cancer's on this list, but uh, not specifically cervical cancer, not specifically colon cancer, but this is where that correlation is made. It's that DNA and that RNA issue. We also see infertility. As I mentioned earlier, we got neural tube defects, but infertility, meaning that low levels of folate, uh, if a woman or man has low levels of folate, remember DNA and RNA replication, how do we, how do we create a healthy sperm? Men, how do we create healthy sperm? Women, how do we create a healthy environment where the cells are replicating adequately? to host a viable pregnancy. So infertility is a, is a common association with low levels of folate. We know that folate you know, can be caused, folate deficiency, I should say, can be caused by malabsorption, which I would be very, very remiss to not talk about gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. I wanna, I wanna switch to a couple of slides because I, I wanna bring those things up. Here's what we know about people with gluten sensitivity and folate. So you can see this study, this was a multi-center trial study performed and published in 2002. What we have, you can see as the results, celiac patients showed a higher total plasma homocysteine. Remember, that's what I talked about earlier, that chemical homocysteine. So what we know is that people with celiac disease have higher homocysteine level than the general population, which is indicative of a poor vitamin status, particularly B vitamins, right? And so in, in accordance, the plasma level of folate and vitamin B6, pyridoxal 5-phosphate, okay, were low. Now, 37% of the people in this research study, 37% were low in folate, okay? So this was a multi-center study, okay, where 37% of the individuals were low in folate with gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. Now, this is another study published in the German Nutrition, or Journal of Human Nutrition and Dietetics in 2013. This study showed that you can see here more than one in 10 of both newly diagnosed and experienced women had inadequate thiamine, which is B1, and then you got folate, so it's not just folate, okay, vitamin A, magnesium, calcium, and iron intake. So again, that folate level being low in individuals with gluten sensitivity um, and celiac disease. And then we have another research study, this one was published in the journal Nutrients, where you can see 20% of the people in this research study Okay, and patients in this study were deficient in folate. So one study showed 37%, another study showed 20%. So bottom line, it's not an uncommon thing to see people with gluten-induced malabsorption. The gluten causes malabsorption, and that can lead to, again, a nutritional deficiency. In this case, we're referring to, or we're talking about folate specifically. So again, um, if you've got a history of gluten sensitivity, you're more likely to have a folate deficiency. And that I think is, is super important to understand because if you haven't had your levels checked, if you haven't had your doctor check your levels, then, um, then you, you probably ought to. It might not be a bad idea. Now I would say this, most doctors are gonna do this. They're gonna check something called serum folic acid. Okay, serum folic acid is not a good way to measure your folate status. What you want is you want intracellular folate, not folic acid, folate measured. Now let's talk about the difference between folate and folic acid. Now there's, there's more than one form of folate, but the most biologically available and active form of folate is called methyl. Folate. Remember, when you when you take in folate in the diet, you're, you know it, it, it comes in many different forms, but ultimately the one that your body uses effectively to do all these things that we've been talking about is the methylated version. 
Okay, and that remember the job of that MTHFR gene is to methylate folate. It's to add a methyl group to folates so that it can activate and do its job. Now, folic acid is not the same thing. What is folic acid? It is a synthetic folate. It's not found anywhere in nature. It's synthetic and it's used to fortify foods. Uh, a number of years ago, it's probably about 30 years ago, neural tube defects, we were talking about that a minute ago, were on the rise. And so there was some research showing that folate would, would deficiency would lead to neural tube defects. So um, food scientists in the United States got together and said, look, let's, let's fortify the food with synthetic folic acid. It's like when you look on a box of cereal, bread, pasta, when you look on like the orange juice or the milk and you're seeing that folic acid, this is a synthetic folate. Now the problem with that, that we know with synthetic folate, is some research says that it promotes certain kinds of cancers. And this is one of the things I don't, I don't recommend looking at, at, at using a supplement that is folic acid. And I don't really, and a lot of people are screaming right now, a lot of scientists are screaming, we need to take the fortification of folic acid out of foods. It's not the proper way to add folate to the diet. This stuff is synthetic and it leads to issues, health problems. Even though it's led to less neural tube defects, it's creating other problems. And so if we just do the right thing by putting the right type of folate in the food, I think we'd be better off. So again, some research shows that synthetic folic acid promotes cancer. It also bogs down the methylation pathway. It causes your body to need a lot more zinc to activate it, and so it can actually increase the risk for zinc deficiency. As a matter of fact, folic acid greater than 350 micrograms um, per day, rather, has been shown to reduce zinc levels. And why is that important? Because zinc plays a role in 700 different biochemical reactions inside the body. We start interfering and lowering zinc we, we can develop DNA mutations. We can develop the increased risk for a number of different cancers. We can make our immune system shut down and be more prone to colds, flus, and other types of infectious disease. Zinc is important for digestive enzyme production. It's an important antioxidant. So if you're eating a bunch of folic acid in your fortified foods and you're getting more than that 350 micrograms a day, you could be also depleting your zinc. And again, this may be one of the reasons why it does actually contribute to an increased risk for cancer. So again, the other place you want to check this is this is especially true if you have RA, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, doctors oftentimes prescribe a medic medicine called methotrexate. Methotrexate is an anti-cancer drug, but they use it. It's also known as a disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug or a DMARC. And this medicine, um, it blocks folate. And so a lot of rheumatologists prescribe folic acid knowing that this drug blocks folate. So, so doctors prescribe folic acid. Now again, if you talk about prescription folic acid, it's the synthetic version. This is something I don't understand about rheumatologists. We have better options than synthetic folic acid. And so in this regard, my, my recommendation would be to talk to your rheumatologist about methylfolate, not, syn not synthetic folic acid, methylfolate, more specifically 5-methyltetrahydrofolate or 5-MTHF, which can be, you know, you can buy it over the counter as a supplement, but it is the methylated version of folate, not the synthetic version, and so you're not going to get that same effect, but it, if supplementing with methylfolate handles or helps if you're taking methotrexate to offset methotrexate actually creating a major problem for you with folate you know, again, with folate deficiency. So important to recognize that. Now on that same topic, let's slide this over. Oh, we're running out of room here. Let's slide this over. And let's talk about some of those medicines that we know interfere with folate. So drugs that reduce folate. Okay, so number one, I just mentioned methotrexate. So again, if you're on methotrexate to treat your rheumatological arthritis, you know that methotrexate can hinder folate. Number two, metformin. Metformin is a medicine oftentimes used to help with blood sugar. This is a diabetic medication, but we know metformin directly causes folate deficiency. Number three, aspirin. 
So those of you maybe have heart disease, your doctor has told you take aspirin to keep your blood thin. This can also cause folate deficiency as well. So you got to be careful here. Number four, antibiotics. There are a number of different antibiotics that can interfere with folate. Some of the folate is actually produced by our probiotics, by our good healthy bacteria. So antibiotics knocking out those good bacteria can actually reduce your level of probiotics as well. So if you're prescribed any of these different medications here, you just want to be aware that folate deficiency can be a problem as a result of that. Now we can add to this list, we can put diuretics on this list. Um, and most commonly diuretics are prescribed to lower blood pressure. So again, if you're diabetic and you have high blood pressure and you're on a diuretic and you're on metformin, okay, this is kind of a double hit for you. The diuretics don't just deplete folate, they can deplete other B vitamins as well. Remember too that excessive caffeine use would classify as a diuretic, so you have to be careful in that regard as well. Um, Let's see here. Alcohol is not really technically a drug, but I think bears mentioning, especially this time of the year when people are drinking a lot more right now, but alcohol is notorious for creating not just low folate, but also low B vitamins as a whole. So again, if you're taking any of these medicines or doing any of these things kind of leisurely, some people do the big caffeine drinks, the Red Bulls and the, and the other um, kind of mega caffeine drinks, the Mountain Dews, etc. You know, you've got to be aware that if you're creating and you're doing multiple of these things, you're potentially inhibiting your ability to absorb folate. You're potentially inhibiting the ability for the folate you have to be utilized properly. And so you're running that risk. And folate deficiency is not something that you want to mess around with. Um, okay, so that should cover most of our meds with folate. Let's move on to some foods. Let's talk about some of these foods that... Um, that are richer in folate. Now, this actually, there's a misnomer here. This says potassium rich, but we could really say these are potassium rich as well, but they're also folate rich foods. If it's green, it's got folate in it. Um, so this is your lettuce, your spinach, uh, your cauliflower, your, your chard, um, your Brussels sprouts, etc., your asparagus, asparagus, but also that what's not on here is a very rich source of folate, which is liver. Okay, liver, um, so those of you who um, maybe are on a carnivore diet or maybe you're, you've been told that you, know, you have to eat more from vegetables um, to get folate, you can get a lot of folate out of liver. You can also get folate, what's not on this list are your, some of your nuts are also rich in folate as well. So these are just other sources of uh, folate. So a number of different dietary sources of folate, but just remember if it's green, it's got a lot of folate in it. And that's, that's going to generally uh, speaking be a good source. So if you're not a big green eater, you need to consider nuts. You need to consider adding uh, potentially liver into your diet to make sure you're getting adequate levels of folate. Now, if you're supplementing with folate, I mentioned earlier um, not to use folic acid. Let's move this out of the way. Um, and that you would really want to go with a better version. There's two decent versions. I'll say put them in order. There's folinic acid, which you might see in a supplement. And then there's also 5-methyltetrahydrofolate, or 5-MTHF. Now, this is, in my opinion, the best form. It is the active form of folate, the one that will drive those methylation cycles for you so that you're producing serotonin and dopamine and glutathione and bile and making new DNA and RNA in a healthy way. This is the active version. Now, folinic acid will also work really well. Now, remember, folinic acid is not the same thing as folic acid. This is natural too. This is a folate in a natural form. So either one of these would be okay. Now, most supplements are going to contain Generally speaking, 400 micrograms, you know, for a pill, for, for a one kind of oral dose, bolus dose, so 400 micrograms. Um, if you're a pregnant woman, you know, it's generally recommended you get at least 800 to 1,000 micrograms because of the increased growth. So you need more during pregnancy. This is what we were talking about earlier with neural tube defects. So again, 
Um, a lot of your ladies, a lot of the prenatal vitamins don't contain folate. They contain folic acid. So I can't emphasize it enough. 5-MTHF, very important to look for that ingredient if you're going to supplement with folate orally. So um, beyond that, you should get plenty in your diet if you're eating some of those foods. Now, if you have an MTHFR mutation, couple of points. Number one, having a mutation does not mean you're, you're broken. A lot of people come to me and they say, Dr. Osborne, I have this mutation and that, that's it's hopeless. You know, I'm not going to be able to do things properly. My body's never going to repair or heal. This is, this is poppycock in its highest sense. A mutation doesn't mean you're broken. A mutation means you have to be extra cautious about your choices in life. A mutation gives you a disadvantage, but it doesn't make you sick. Okay, a mutation and bad choices makes you sick. So if we say mutation plus bad choices, well, what is a bad choice? A bad choice is you're eating fast food. A bad choice is you're, you're um, not sleeping adequately. A bad choice is you're being exposed to massive quantities of chemicals in your cosmetics or in your hair care products or other things. The bad choices is that you eat a diet that maybe is the wrong diet for you as a unique person. So aside from the common sense rule of we can't get healthy eating food that's not healthy, some people are sensitive to certain foods or allergic to certain foods. And so those would be examples of bad choices. Not getting adequate sunshine, bad choice. Not getting adequate sleep, not getting adequate exercise, eating the wrong diet, chemical exposures. Those are, when I say bad choices, Again, and sometimes you may not, you may be making bad choices, not even know you're making bad choices because you don't have specific information about what your body needs specifically. But I think most people could agree that exercise, sunshine, and sleep, and healthy food are all things that everybody can pretty much agree on um, are, are the antithesis to bad choices, right? So it's where people fail in those decisions and they have a mutation that that mutation starts to show up as problematic. It kind of let me give you an analogy. It would kind of be like let's say that that your job was to run marathons, but you were a horrible marathon runner. Like you were not genetically gifted to run long distances. You can run really fast for short distances, but the second the distance goes up over a couple of miles, your body starts to break down and you do really terribly. Now imagine if that was you. If you had a a poor genetic ability to perform athletically in marathons, and your job every day was to run marathons. How healthy would you be if that was what your job was? You would actually, your health would be destroyed slowly over time. And this is what I'm referring to. The mutation doesn't make you sick. The mutation plus your environment, and your environment is typically those bad choices, is what predisposes you more greatly to developing a problem. So keep that in mind. Those of you that have an MTHFR mutation, all is not lost. All hope is not um, forever lost. So, so got to keep that in mind. Otherwise, you get, you get depressed just thinking about it. So remember, a mutation doesn't create disease. A mutation plus bad choices increases the risk for the development or the probability for the development of disease. But by itself, a mutation does not lead to disease. I actually have this mutation, and I'm perfectly healthy. As far as I know, all my lab tests and everything else, as far as I know, I'm perfectly healthy, and you can be too. And if you're struggling, don't blame your genes right? Look at your choices and ask yourself, am I, can I, and should I be making different choices or better choices? So all that being said, let's break down some of the questions that are coming in. Angeline um, wants to know, can folate deficiency cause cell damage and DNA damage? Yes, uh, it absolutely can. There's research that shows that lack of folate leads to the inability for DNA to prop properly replicate and repair itself. So that lead that in effect is the damage, right? So good question. The answer is absolutely yes. Um, let's see here. Okay, so Angeline, another question. What causes high blood serum B12 if not supplementing and what to do about it? This is where um, you may be getting excessive folic acid. One of the causes, one of the things that elevates serum B12 is folic acid. And this is one of the problems with the food fortification of folic acid is that it can actually elevate vitamin B12. Um, and so that may be part of the issue. But you also may have, there may be some genetic mutation 
that's not allowing you to properly convert your vitamin B12 as well, and that can lead to elevations in serum B12. Um, best thing to do is get with your get with your functional doc and get some specific testing done to try to determine what is contributing to that. Um, we'll come back to that one. The question, uh, so we'll answer that at the very end because this is another big question we keep getting. Um, for those, the question is, for those who decide to get a COVID vaccine, what to do to reduce the side effects? So I'm going to come back to that. I promise we'll get that answer before we sign out tonight. Um, Answered that one. Can a 5-MTHF deficiency cause adult non-epileptic seizures late in life? Seizure activity can't be seen on two of my EEGs. Yeah, I mean, folate deficiency causes neurological dysfunction. It, it absolutely can affect the nervous system. Um, I've seen folate be associated with epileptic seizure uh, where the MRIs were normal, where the EEGs were normal, and somebody was still having a seizure. The doctor didn't really know, how, you know what to cause the seizure or what caused the seizure. And we found individuals, oftentimes we find them, they're very depleted in B vitamins, folate being one of those B vitamins. You can also see seizure disorder related with vitamin B1 and vitamin B12 deficiency, vitamin B6 deficiency. So it's not just folate. There are other B vitamins that can contribute to that. Um, let's see. Okay, I think I answered the difference between folate and folic acid. The biggest difference is synthetic. Um, Okay, so Stacy asks, how does the deficiency affect your brain? Um, predominantly, folate deficiency affects your brain because of the anemia aspect. You don't get adequate oxygen. That's one of the components. Um, so low oxygen to the brain equals brain fog, memory, clouded thinking, etc. But elevations in homocysteine is also known to damage nerve tissue. Um, so it's a, homocysteine is a neurotoxin, and there's linkage to elevations in homocysteine and dementia, or early onset Alzheimer's. So it can affect your brain by creating uh, or elevating the chemical that's known to create inflammation and damage to brain tissue. Um, Yeah, so Robert asks, I've heard that folic acid has been linked to cancer. Is that true? Yes, synthetic folate has been linked to cancer in some research. Um, can folate help with PTSD? Depending on what's causing the PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder is what I assume you mean there. Um, you know, po post-traumatic stress disorder has a number of different causes. Is folate going to cure that? Probably not. But if a person with PTSD is trying to heal and they're getting the right therapies and they're, and they're trying to make the right adjustments to their diet and lifestyle, if they have a, a folate deficiency, it definitely could hinder their capacity for the healing process. Um, does the lack of folate cause inflammation? Yes, it can. Remember, homocysteine is an inflammatory chemical. And so not adequately, not adequately um, controlling it can lead to increased vascular inflammation, neural inflammation, uh, kidney inflammation, etc. High cholesterol. Uh, well, this really isn't about cholesterol, and I wouldn't really say that folate does a whole lot with cholesterol. Um, let's see, I take methotrexate uh, plus folate as a treatment for rheumatism. Is this due to methotrexate reducing folate? Yes, Kirsten, that is exactly right. Uh, methotrexate causes folate deficiencies Why your rheumatologist has you on that. Again, as I mentioned earlier, make sure you're on folate, not folic acid. Um, as you don't want to increase the risk of problems from synthetic folate. Uh, let's keep scrolling down. Uh, Tiffany is saying, I noticed that teeth imprints around the sides of my tongue. 
uh, looks scalloped. Could this be related to folate? Yeah, so glossitis, um, which is inflammation of the tongue and swollen tongue, this is where, you know, when your tongue is too large and you're, in, you know, you're, you're biting down, your teeth will actually scallop in the sides of the tongue, and that can absolutely be um, a sign of that. So that is definitely what we were talking about. Um, B6 causing high oxalates, it, it, it can technically, um, I did a show, Shanquilla, on high oxalates, B6, calcium, and other things. If you go back in our, in the Pick Dr. Osborne Brain archives, you can find that show and you can learn all about oxalates in more detail. Yeah, I love that story. Stacy says, when I was misdiagnosed and put on a mood stabilizer, my doctor also had me taking folate. I didn't need the mood stabilizer, uh, but needed the folate. And as soon as I got off the meds, I healed 100%. That's a, that's a common story that I hear is a lot of times, remember, when doctors make that claim that you have a, a, a chemical imbalance in the brain, and then they give you a chemical, um, without measuring any chemicals, right? It's a very subjective diagnosis, meaning you, you know, to say you have a chemical imbalance in the brain without measuring any chemicals and then give you a drug as an experiment to see how you respond, in my opinion, that's not really an intelligent, objective a way about going about trying to help somebody. Um, it actually is, it's a, it's a way to go about creating a drug dependence for somebody. If, if the drug works to mask their symptoms, it doesn't mean that it's solving the problem. Uh, let's see. We love your thoughts on SIBO. Um, so we'll get, we got a whole show planned on SIBO, Jessica, so be patient with me. We're going to come to that in due time. It's just too far off the topic tonight. What does it mean if your MCV is high as well as B12 and folate and you are using methylated vitamins? So if you have... If the doc, it depends, Deidre. So if, you're, if your MCV is high, you're using B12 and your folate, and your folate and your B12 are high in your serum because you're taking you know, maybe higher doses of those vitamins. Look, vitamin supplementation is going to elevate your serum levels of, of, of whichever nutrient it is that you're taking. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's creating a toxicity, however. So um, to answer your question... Um, if your MCV is still high, there may be something else that's contributing to it. B6 deficiency can also cause elevations in MCV. So there are other, certainly other things that can lead to that. Um, let's scroll down a little bit more on that side. Can folate deficiency cause inability to detox heavy metals? Well, it certainly doesn't help. Um, one of the ways we get rid of heavy metal or that we prevent the resorption of heavy metals is through bile binding through the intestine. Remember, as I showed you earlier, that methylation cycle is a necessity to generate properly bile acids. So yes, the answer is that folate deficiency could hinder your body's ability to deplete um, toxic metals if you should so happen to have a toxic metal issue. Okay. All right, so we've got about 10 minutes left. We've got a bunch of questions there. Uh, let's go back to this one. GN wants to know if somebody is diagnosed with severe anemia taking a milligram of methylfolate, um, what about zinc? I mentioned that, that, uh, that 350 micrograms of folic acid could deplete zinc. Should you consider, consider taking a zinc supplement? Yeah, you, sh you should and you could for sure. And as far as like quantity, a good place to start with a zinc supplement if you've got no testing and you're just trying to be safe and supportive is about 25 milligrams of zinc per day would be a, a reasonable amount to take. But what I would encourage you to do, GN, is to, is to actually have your zinc levels evaluated and that way you could get more specific as to what quantity um, to take. Um, okay, so let's dive in then to um, one of the questions that I think is kind of timely right now, and that is, um, would, would I take the mRNA vaccine for COVID-19? And I think really the simplest way to put it is absolutely not. Uh, and there are a number of different reasons why. 
uh, I know some of the people uh, were asking the question, what do you do to detox from having to get the vaccine? First and foremost, I want to make it very, very clear that there's nobody in this country, the United States of America, uh, that legally should be or uh, could be able to be coerced into taking the vaccine. Um, and, that, and that there certainly are more of us than them, right? There are more humans in, in the population than there are government officials trying to mandate and dictate your life without giving you informed consent. But here's what we know so far about the mRNA vaccine from some of the earlier trials that were done. Uh, one of the trials showed 13 deaths. That's not been reported by mainstream media. They're not talking about it. In another one of the trials for this vaccine, they actually didn't use the proper type of placebo. Usually in a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial, we use a, what's called a placebo. A placebo is supposed to be an inert, uh, an inert ingredient that causes no harm, and that way it's not, it's not disrupting the potential to analyze for side effects. And so what one of these research studies did is they used a meningitis vaccine, which is a very... Uh, it's one of the vaccines that are given today that has a pretty high um, side effect profile. So they actually used a vaccine that had a high side effect profile as a placebo, which skews the actual quantity of people having negative and adverse reactions to the favor of the drug manufacturers. So it, it, it makes the drug look safer than what it actually might be. So you've got to do proper placebo testing to get an honest answer as to what's the real risk potentially of the vaccine creating the potential for harm because this thing has been rushed. Remember that drug manufacturers have been trying to, to manufacture and create a coronavirus vaccine, not, not a SARS-CoV-2 virus, but a coronavirus vaccine for the last 30 years and they failed. And the big reason why they failed is number one, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an RNA type of virus that mutates very, very quickly. So vaccines would be largely ineffective because of the, the, the potential for the virus to mutate. Number two, um, they don't really ever get past animal trials because the animals take on too much damage too quickly. So in animal trials, but what we've done with this thing with warp speed is we've fast tracked everything. We've rushed it without proper safety. And they're making the claim that there's this 90% efficacy. Well, what's that claim based on? How can you give people who don't have COVID a vaccine and say that it prevented COVID 90% of the time? That makes no sense. Um, that you, how do you prove it? You can't prove it, and that's the whole conundrum. It, to, to make the claim that a vaccine is 90% effective uh, uh, at reducing COVID is, is a, in my opinion, is not a claim that could be made. Now, uh, someone argued that the claim is that the 90% the effective at reducing the symptoms. Well, imagine that if you take a, a sick person with COVID and you reduce their symptoms, you take away their fever and you take away their cough and their sneeze and their aches, and then they don't stay home and then they go out in the world. And now we have what's known as a true asymptomatic spreader. What, what the media has been saying this whole time about asymptomatic spread is largely non-scientific and false information. It's fake news, if you will. And so there's no such thing as an asymptomatic spreader, but when you vaccinate people to reduce their symptoms, you create asymptomatic spreaders. And that to me creates a conundrum and a potential for the greater ability for something like this to be spreading. Uh, but the biggest reason why I wouldn't take a COVID-19 vaccine is it's just there's no safety data. And ultimately, my immune system is going to be as strong as I take care of myself. And uh, I'd rather take my chances personally with a virus that has a 99.5% survival rate than with a vaccine that has no long-term safety data, uh, has the potential to manipulate your RNA and the way your RNA behaves, which I don't, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that. It's relatively untested area of science. We don't know what the long-term ramifications are. And many of you are asking, well, if, what if I'm forced? Don't let them force it. You have the right to stand up, stand up with your peers, stand up with your fellow citizens and demand informed consent and demand that you're able to maintain medical autonomy. The decisions that you should be able to make about your own health are, are your decisions to make and no authority has uh, the legality to come in and mandate something, especially that's untested, unproven, and has no safety data. So don't bend over. Don't be supine uh, to the powers that be that are trying to force this thing without proper safety testing. And, and they're trying to create, you know, all these campaigns of safety when in fact they don't have that data. I think one of the most recent studies showed that there was a 27% of the people actually had some degree of major side effects. So that, I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's too much, especially when we're talking about mass vaccinating 
hundreds of millions of people uh, for the guise of safety. Look, the safest thing that you can do is eat well, sleep well, drink well, stay hydrated, exercise well, and surround yourself with loving, caring um, individuals who, who have a vested interest in your health as well. Like that's what you can do. No vaccine is gonna save us um, and has the power to save us. So anyway, I'm not gonna harp too much on that, but I would say it's not about what you can take to offset the toxicants in the vaccine. It's about protecting yourself and your ability to make a choice. So don't have a supine attitude. That's the best advice I can give you. I can tell you they'll have to, they'll have to hold me down and kill me before I take a vaccine like that. And I say that with conviction. It's just not something I'm going to be willing to take part of. Okay. So Linda asks, if you take a B vitamin complex and it has folic acid, not folate, should you add folate? No, you should quit taking that B vitamin complex because it's no good. Um, if you want a good solid B complex, I would recommend, we've got a couple of different things over at Gluten Free Society, but one of them is B Complete. And it's a full B complex um, vitamin supplement that has all of the methylated versions of folate in it. So, or methylated folate, but also methylcobalamin, methylated versions, I should say, of B vitamins. So the active forms of B vitamins, including the methylated versions. Don't take folic acid in your multivitamin. And ladies, I, I would implore any of you that are taking a prenatal that has folic acid, go check out our basic prenatal as well. It's, uh, we have something called ultra prenatal, uh, which is formulated with methylated folate as opposed to folic acid. So keep that synthetic nonsense out of your body. Um, let's see here. Uh, Kristen says, I can't find an EMD who will do nutrient testing. Uh, they just want to give you drugs uh, with side effects. Well, Kristen, you don't go to a medical doctor typically to get your nutrition checked unless you want to. That would be, I'm, I don't know, I'm going to use an analogy here. Going to a medical doctor to have your nutritional levels checked is equivalent to going, an elect, going to an electrician to have your toilet fixed. Now, medical doctors don't really train in nutrition. Most doctors will admit it. They have less than seven hours of total nutritional training in med school. They're not experts. You don't go to somebody who's non-expert in that area to give you advice in that area. Now, I know many of you don't realize that, that medical doctors don't have adequate nutritional training, and so this may be kind of news to you. But it's absolutely true. This is one of the reasons why medical doctors won't run nutritional testing because they don't understand nutrition. And so you don't want to go to somebody who's not trained to give you advice because what happens to the results? When the results come back, let's say your medical doctor does run the test for you and the results are abnormal, then how do you know what to do? How do you know what to take? Who's going to interpret that result and help guide you in, in terms if they don't know anything about it? Uh, most doctors that I've, I've seen people bring in their lab tests to me and they say, Dr. Osborne, my medical doctor ran this, didn't really know what to do with it. And they just told me that if I took Centrum, you know, at Walgreens and, and that I would be just fine and it would correct these deficiencies. And that's a laughable advice, right? So you, again, you don't want to take advice from somebody who's not qualified to give it. And nutrition is one area that very few people are actually qualified to give nutritional advice. And, you know, in, in the realm of doctors, there's something called the, uh, the American Clinical Board of Nutrition or the ACBN, and, and this is the entity that certifies doctors' postgraduate education levels uh, of adequacy around the, the field of nutrition. So if you're looking for a doctor who's really well-versed in nutrition you want help, look for the delineation behind their name, DACBN. That stands for Diplomate American Clinical Board of Nutrition. It is the only board certification that doctors can get postgraduately that guarantee a minimum criteria of knowledge around the field of nutrition. It's, you know, postgraduate, it's two, it takes an additional two years of schooling to get board certified. It, you have to write case studies, you have to publish in, in a journal. So there's a, there's a lot of rigor behind going the extra mile and getting that education. And I would say, look, if you're looking for nutritional advice from a from a doc, you've got to find somebody who's qualified to give it. And that's not to say that an MD can't be qualified to give it, because some of them are. Some of them are board certified, but you just have to find those ones who are so that you can get the right help. 
Uh, okay. Well, I think we're out of time anyway, so the questions keep coming. But hey, keep those questions coming. Make sure you email us at glutenology at gmail.com with those questions or show topics that you'd like us to see covered in the new year. Um, we're, we're curating topic ideas many, many months out in advance. And so if you've got a topic we feel like would be a great fit for our audience, um, we'll feature it. Um, hey, if you're, again, if you're new to the show and you want more information, do a couple of things. Number one, make sure you subscribe um, to our channel. But two, go over to glutenfreesociety.org, O-R-G, and sign up for our newsletter. It's the one way that we can guarantee that, you're, that our information won't be censored. Um, remember, we've been censored through this whole ordeal. YouTube has censored us. Facebook has censored us. The New York Post has written hit pieces against us. Um, so, so, you know, doctors like myself are under the attack of mainstream media and, and they do everything they can to censor us. So to make sure you can get our information, make sure you go sign up for our newsletter. It's the one control point that we have that we know is not currently actively being censored, at least not yet. So make sure you sign up for our newsletter. You can do that at glutenfreesociety.org. Look, I'm, I'm wishing all of you fantastic health. I hope you all have a fantastic New Year's, and we'll see you in 2021 for more of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Take care and good night. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is going to allow us to remind you right before we go live. But it's also going to allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long, and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much, and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.